This message is a presentation of Pinnacle Baptist Church and the preaching ministry of Pastor Ray McBerry. Other messages like this are available online at PinnacleBaptist.com. The church is located at 2517 High Falls Road in Griffin, Georgia. If you're in the area, we would love for you to visit us this Sunday. Now, here's today's message. This morning I want to bring a message to you that I think is pertinent for the day and time in which we live and seems to be becoming more so day by day. So I'm going to ask you if you're able to, to turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 14 and then hold your place there. When everyone has found it, we'll stand and read our text together this morning. Uh, but as uh, by way of introduction, let me just say that, um, you know, we live in a day and time that is unparalleled in the history of mankind and the history of the church. I suppose if there's any time that could be a similar a parallel to it would be, as the Bible says, in the days of Noah. We are reaching a time in human history where all of the things that have been prophesied for the last 6,000 years are beginning to fall into place one right after the other, and the stage is now set for those end-time events that are described in the book of Revelation, in the book of Daniel, and other places throughout the scriptures. Now, I am not setting any dates. I'm not telling you when any of those specific events are going to transpire. But uh, a Christian would be a fool of a Christian not to believe that the things we're seeing in the news, in the headlines every day, point to the fact that we are getting closer than ever to the return of the Lord Jesus in the clouds, all those events that will unfold after that. I am a premillennialist. That is, I believe the rapture of the church will be before the millennium. I'm also a pre-tribulationalist. I believe the rapture of the church will take place not only before the millennium, but before the tribulation before that. I believe the Bible teaches it. I believe that the Apostle Paul was pre-trib. I believe John was pre-trib. I believe that every, every author human author of this book was pre-trib, and I am too. But I will tell you, we are not guaranteed of how bad things might get before the tribulation gets here. I don't think we're going to go through the tribulation. I don't think Jesus would ask or expect or require His bride to go through the time of wrath. In fact, I think the Bible is clear that He says we will not go through the time of wrath. But there are already Christians being persecuted in places all around the world. And it's, it's been going on since the church began 2,000 some odd years ago. So you and I, I think, would be very foolish to believe that things might not get worse than they are right now before we get to the rapture and the tribulation after that. You and I ought to make sure that we have decided the convictions that we hold. Our convictions ought to be based on this book and this book alone. And once you decide this is my conviction, you ought to stand on it. Amen? Amen. We ought to know what our convictions are and we ought to stand upon those convictions. Because I'm going to tell you that if the Lord tarries His coming any amount of time at all, you and I are going to face days where our convictions are going to come under attack more than they ever have before, and you and I are going to be required to make a decision whether we're going to compromise on this, that, or another of our convictions, or whether we're going to stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, anything this book says is not up for debate. It's cut and dried, and it's what we ought to do. There are other matters that come up in life, though, that this Bible doesn't specifically address. Many of them are a very practical nature in our day-to-day -day lives. And while the, the book may not speak specifically to a particular issue, it gives us principles by which we ought to determine 
what we ought to do in those situations. And the Bible teaches us in the New Testament that we not only have the Word of God, which is always to be the final authority, but when something isn't specifically addressed in Scripture, God has put within every man and woman a conscience that will either be guilty before Him or not guilty before Him on whether we sincerely try to please Him in all that we do. And that's where those biblical principles come in. Applying them to everyday issues of life. As your pastor, the one thing I have tried to do the entire seven years that Pinnacle Baptist Church has existed is, is to try to inculcate within every person here a love for this book. Because the truth is, if I can get you to fall in love with this book, I don't have to convince you of anything else. Because if you'll fall in love with this book, you'll want to read this book. And if you read this book, you'll see for yourself what the Word of God says. Now, I know that the preacher has his place in God's whole scheme of things. The Bible says in the Old Testament, the preacher is supposed to read the Scripture and give the sense of it. That is, I'm supposed to explain it. I'm supposed to try to help you understand what it's saying and how to apply it to our everyday lives. But if you read it for yourself, nine times out of ten, you can understand it for yourself. And if you read and ask the Holy Spirit to help you understand it, He's going to help you understand it. So when those issues come up that are not specifically addressed in this book, you and I, both as individuals and as a church, are called upon to do the best we can to interpret each issue of life in light of the biblical principles that we've learned. Because our overriding goal ought to be to please Him. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 9, Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. Folks, that's our goal. To be accepted of Him. To be well-pleasing to Him. Whether in this life or present with Him in front of the holy angels. And if our desire is to please Him, we're going to want to know what this book says about everything it says something about. And the things it doesn't specifically address, we're going to want to know what are the biblical principles that are found in this book. That I can use to apply to those things that arise. Because I want to please Him. So if you're able to, would you please stand with me out of respect for God's Word. As I invite you to look at Romans chapter 14 this morning. In Romans chapter 14, there are several verses we'll read together. I'll read them and you follow along. They're not all together, but they're all in the same chapter. So follow along with me if you would. Romans 14, beginning in verse 4. Paul, writing under inspiration of the Holy Ghost of God, says, Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Look at verse 8. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. Look at verse 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Verse 12. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. 
Dear friends, when that day comes, for the lost at the great white throne judgment, and for the saved at the judgment seat of Christ, every one of us will give account of himself to God. I will not give account of you to God, except as your pastor, but you will give account of yourself to God. I will give account of myself to God. Each of us will give account of himself or herself to God for whether we try to please him in every decision of life. I'd like to bring a message to you this morning entitled, The Sacred Conscience. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that this morning you would give me clarity of thought and clarity of speech. Lord, that I might share with our people the important doctrines of the Word of God regarding the conscience you've placed within each of us. And God, I pray that every one of us here would have a desire in our heart above all else to please you. And Lord, that as decisions come up every day in our lives, we would put all of them, look at all of them through the lens of Scripture. The principles you've given us that we might make the right decision in pleasing you with our lives. I pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake only. Amen. And you may be seated. In colonial America, before the Constitution was signed, creating these United States, in fact, even before the Declaration of Independence was signed, before there was a war for American independence. Up and down the colonies, uh, there were churches just like Pinnacle Baptist Church. There were Baptist churches. There were also some Methodist churches, some Presbyterian churches. There were other kinds of churches too. But there were men and women of God who sincerely loved God and tried to please Him, just like you and I hopefully are trying to do today at Pinnacle Baptist Church in our individual lives and as a church. In colonial Virginia, as well as some of the other colonies, Baptist preachers were told that because they were not part of the established religion, the official religion or the state religion of the colony, they were not allowed to preach without a license from the government. Well, the Baptists in the 1700s were much like the Baptists today. They said, we're not taking a license from the government to do something God has already told us to do. And that is to preach the gospel. So in colonial Virginia, just like in colonial Massachusetts and a lot of other places, Baptist preachers were routinely thrown in jail just for preaching the gospel. On one particular occasion, Mr. John Waller, a Baptist preacher, and two other Baptists with him, went to visit the home of a man in Virginia uh, that uh, was a shut-in. Because of his health and his age, he was not able to get out. He was not able to go to church anywhere. And so they went to whole church in his home uh, to try to minister to him. Well, the authorities in Virginia who were... Church of England, they discovered that there were some Baptists holding service unlicensed in the home of that man. So, they sent the authorities. They knocked at the door, they burst in the door, and they arrested John Waller and the other two Baptist preachers that were there trying to tend to this man's spiritual needs. They were dragged before the local magistrate. The magistrate said, are you preaching without a license? Mr. John Waller said, yes, sir, I am. I'm preaching what God's told me to preach. And so the magistrate there said, well, listen, we've told you Baptists before, you're not supposed to preach in this state or this colony without a license. He said, and he named the first man, he said, your fine will be 10 pounds. I guess he was just there, wasn't really participating, he was just there for moral support. Uh, the second man he said, your fine will be 20 pounds. 
English sterling pounds. He said, John Waller, your fine will be 30 pounds. Pay your fine and you can go. Well, I don't know about the first two men, but John Waller said, no, sir, I'm not paying the fine. And the magistrate, getting red in the face, said, oh, yes, you are paying the fine. You'll either pay the fine of 30 pounds or you'll pay the fine with 30 stripes on your back in the town square. I already told you, he wasn't a hard shell Baptist, but he was a hard-headed Baptist, just like most Baptist preachers. And he said, I'm not paying the fine. So they took him out to the town square. They took a whip. Miss Mary, that had not just one long piece of leather on it, it had three pieces of leather on it. And they tied him to the whipping post in the middle of the town square, and they proceeded to beat this Baptist preacher for preaching the gospel in a man's house. Word spread, and a lot of things began to change, and colonial Virginia because of finding out what happened to John Waller that day. But he preached out of conviction, both because he had a command from God clearly printed in Scripture, and because his conscience would not allow him to do anything other than that. And to have taken a license from the government, by the way, the word license means permission. Dear friends, this Baptist preacher feels the same way John Waller felt. It's not the government that gives me permission to preach. It's God that not only gives me permission to preach, but a command to preach. This Baptist preacher won't ever take a license to preach any more than John Waller did. And if things continue to change and the laws change, and they say this or that is the penalty for preaching without a license here in the 21st century, I guess you'll have to come find me and uh, uh, tend to my wounds or bail me out if you choose to do so. But I'm not paying the fine, whether it's British pounds or Federal Reserve notes. But we all daily encounter situations in life where we have to make decisions about things that come up. Hopefully you or I, neither one, will ever have to make a decision between paying a fine or 30 lashes. But we all have to make decisions on a regular basis. Well, is this okay to do as a Christian or should I do this instead? Because there are a lot of things that go on in the 21st century that I'm sure the men who penned this book never conceived, and God did not tell them about things to do with technology from the 21st century by name. But He did give them some principles to pass along to us to help us make those decisions. You and I have a conscience. Now this morning we're going to look at several passages that are all in the book of Romans. I have chosen intentionally to stay within the book of Romans so that everybody that's willing and able can follow along with me and see the scriptures for yourself. So if you're here this morning or if you're watching online some way or another, I hope that you'll follow along and turn to these scriptures and see them for yourself. The Bible tells us that we all have a conscience. The Bible says that from the time that Adam and Eve ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden, before they were ever kicked out of the garden, they had the knowledge of what was right and what was wrong and the difference between the two. Folks, that's your conscience. God's plan for them was to be without sin and never even have to deal with the difference between good and evil to just be clean, without sin. But they chose to disobey, just like Satan chose to disobey. As a result, when they ate that fruit, they immediately began to know the difference between good and evil. Now they began to have choices to make. 
They had to make choices from every day after that. Whether they would do right or do wrong. Whether this is right or whether this is wrong. Every man and woman born since then who's able to understand and think rationally for himself or herself, has the same conscience, the same ability to know the difference between right and wrong, and the same responsibility to do right. Because the Creator put the conscience within us. You see, that's how your conscience knows what's right and wrong naturally. It's God that put it there. And the reason it says this is right and this is wrong is because God's the one that put it there and God is the one that makes the rules. He's the one that draws the line. Why? Because God is good. The Bible says in Him is no darkness at all. Our God is goodness. So he made sure that that conscience that every man and woman are born with starts out working the way it's supposed to work and knowing the difference between right and wrong. It doesn't mean we always follow that conscience and do what's right, but we all start out knowing what's right and what's wrong. I entitled this message the sacred conscience because the conscience you have is sacred. It's not sacred the way Shirley MacLaine would want you to think of your conscience as being sacred. It's not sacred because you are sacred in that you have in that you are God yourself. It's not the lie that Satan tried to pass along. It's not the lie that the Mormons try to pass along that you can become a God yourself. It's not Shirley MacLaine and the New Age Movement's law that you are Christ yourself. You just, got, you just have to find it within you. No, it's not that kind of sacred conscience. But your conscience is sacred because God put it there. And God made it to work properly when He gave it to you. He gave it to us because when man ate in the Garden of Eden... His soul died spiritually. And his body began the process of dying. But his soul shriveled up and died immediately. That's why every man and woman need to have their soul regenerated. The word generate means to bring to life. The word regenerate means to bring back to life. You see, man originally was created a living soul, but when he ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Adam and Eve, both their soul shriveled up and became a dead soul in need of being quickened, made alive, regenerated. When you and I were born, we were born sinners. We were born sinners because of Adam and Eve's sin that we inherited. And we were also sinners, doubly so, because the first opportunity you and I had to do right or wrong, as a little one, we chose to do what all kids do. We chose to do what we wanted to do, and somewhere along the line, you and I did wrong. Brother John, I know it's probably hard to believe, but at some point, you were a cute little fella, and your mama had to spank you, because you did wrong, even as a little fella. Miss Sally would say that's no big surprise to her. But at some point when Brother John was just a little fella, he still did wrong. He is a sinner just like you and I are a sinner in that he was born a sinner because of the original sin he inherited from Adam and Eve. But he's doubly so a sinner like you and I are doubly so sinners because as a child when he had a choice to make, the first time he knew something was wrong and he knew the difference, he still made the wrong choice. But it was his conscience. As a little fella, he didn't yet know the gospel. He didn't yet know the plan of salvation. But as a little fella, 
just like you when you were a little fella or a little gal. You had a conscience you were born with that was a gift from God that told you this is right and this is wrong. And you and I still did wrong. Just like Brother John did when he was a little fella. But we're born with a conscience. God gave us that conscience because lost man, just like saved man, needs a way to realize that he's wrong. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 3 that the law was given to the children of Israel so that they could know what was right and what was wrong. Romans 3.20 tells us the reason that He gave us the law. That He gave Israel the law. He said that every mouth may be stopped. And everyone may become guilty before God. You see, Israel could read the Old Testament Scriptures for themselves. The Ten Commandments. The laws of Moses. And the Jew could read for himself and know he had violated the law of God, was guilty, was a sinner, and needed a Savior. That was the purpose of the law. It was not to save anybody because nobody can keep all the law. The purpose of the law was to show Jews that they were guilty before God. But what about the Gentiles? My ancestors weren't Jews. My ancestors were Scots, TR says maybe some Irish too, Cherokee, you probably are the same. You have a mixture of different heritages. I would dare say, and in the congregation our side, there could be someone with Jewish background, but more than likely we're all Gentiles. We probably don't have any Jewish background in us. So what about our ancestors who didn't have the law to tell them this is right and this is wrong? You see, they had their conscience. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 2, go ahead and turn there with me this morning. If you haven't already turned back to chapter 3, turn with me now to chapter 2. Look at verse 14. For with the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. My ancestors, your ancestors who were Gentiles, they didn't have the law of Moses, but they had something that told them the difference between right and wrong. And that is the conscience that God puts within every man and woman. My ancestors, therefore, were just as guilty as the children of Israel were. Because while they didn't have the law of God in writing to read, they had a conscience that told them certain things are right and certain things are wrong. And my ancestors, just like yours, did wrong. Their conscience was supposed to bring conviction to show them they were wrong and to lead them in the right direction to seek God, to seek the Creator. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 1, beginning, beginning in verse 18, that God has put within every man not only the knowledge of what's right and what's wrong, but, but the knowledge that He exists as the Creator. Look at Romans 1.18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. 
being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Friends, your conscience does something for you besides just tell you something's right and something's wrong. The conscience you were born with that God says is put within man is the natural knowledge that there is a God. There is a Creator. And by inference, if there's a Creator, we're accountable to Him. If He made us, we're answerable to Him. And Carl Sagan and Bill Nye and Bill Mayer and all the other atheists and agnostics so-called can say what they want to to say they don't believe in God or I don't know if there's a God, but they're all liars. Why? The Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. If they say something that contradicts this book, you know who I'm going with? I'm going with God. And they're the liars. And if they say they don't believe in God, or they don't know if there's a God, they're lying. For they were born with the knowledge that there's a God. They were born with the knowledge there's a Creator. And they were born with the knowledge that they're accountable to Him. You see, it's that last part they don't like. They say they don't believe in God. They say there is no God because they don't want to give account to a holy, righteous God. They don't want anybody telling them what they can do or can't do. They don't want anybody making the rules for them. That's our whole society today, isn't it? Our whole society has come to this point. But that's a... That's a pretty bad place to be in. That's not where God made us. He made us with a knowledge of right and wrong and a knowledge that there is a God, a Creator. And God gives man a conscience to know the difference between good and evil and to know he has an obligation to please the Creator, to please God. Man, whether he has the Scriptures or not, is accountable to God for what he does. What are the effects of sinning against our conscience? We've already established from Scripture that everybody's born with a conscience. There's no doubt about it. There's no question about it. It's not up for debate. But what happens then when someone begins to Sin against their conscience. You say, preacher, how do you sin against your conscience? Well, you sin against your conscience when you're confronted with a decision to make. Is this okay or is this not okay? And our conscience tells us this is not okay to do. And we do it anyway. That's a sin committed not only against God, but against our own conscience. Don't look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about because we've all been there before. Amen. We've all had times that our conscience has told us, even before you got saved, by the way. Don't confuse the conscience with the Holy Spirit. Maybe I'll say another word about that shortly. But, but even before you got saved, you had a time, probably a bunch of times, where you thought about doing this or that and you knew it was wrong, but you did it anyway. Folks, that is sinning against not only God, but your own conscience. The conscience that God put in you to help you please Him. Look with me still in Romans 1 at the effects of sinning against your own conscience. Look at verse 21. Because that when they knew God... They glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. 
one of the effects of sinning against your own conscience is that your heart becomes darkened. Now it becomes black with sin because that's what sin does. But when it says their foolish heart was darkened, it means that conscience God put within us, it stops working as well. If you and I are, we know the difference between right and wrong because that's the way we're born, the more we sin against that conscience and go against that conscience and continue to do things we know are in violation of that conscience, after a while, the conscience stops working like it's supposed to work. It stops working as well as it should work. The Bible says elsewhere that the Christian and the lost person can have their conscience seared. 1 Timothy 4.2 Don't have to turn there now. Write it down if you want to or go back and listen to this. But the Bible says you can even have a seared conscience. What is a seared conscience? You know what it means to sear something? It's the same as cauterizing a wound. If you have a bad wound, it's possible in some situations, like an amputation or something similar, to stop the bleeding so the person doesn't die. They'll take something hot, put it directly to the flesh, and it cauterizes the wound. It sears the flesh, the vessels, to stop the bleeding. The Bible says if we continue to sin, the conscience that's supposed to work the way it is supposed to work, the conscience that you were born with that worked perfectly when you were born, the more we continue to sin against our conscience, the less and less it works like it's supposed to. Till we get to the point that it's possible that the conscience can be seared and not perform the function it's supposed to function. Folks, that's the reason that all these Hollywood people, all these uh, rock stars, all these Wicca practitioner, uh, practitioners, these atheists, Satanists, people in witchcraft, whatever else, you think to yourself, how can even a lost person do some of the vile, wicked things that they do? How can a human even think of those things? It's because their foolish heart was darkened and their conscience has become seared and it no longer functions like yours does. Folks, that's scary. And in 1 Timothy 4.2, Paul says even the Christian's heart can be, uh, become seared. Even his conscience can become seared. By living in sin and continuing to make sinful choices, we get to the point that our conscience God gave us just doesn't work like it's supposed to work. Look at verse 22. Professing themselves to be wise... They became fools. There's another effect of sinning against one's conscience. The person becomes a fool. Oh, he or she may not realize they're now a fool, but they're a fool. Preacher, how are they a fool? The Bible says, call no man a fool. So how are they fools and why, was, why is God calling them that? You see, any time a man or a woman views himself different than God views Himself, He's a fool. And that's one of the effects of sinning against that sacred conscience. Look at verse 23. And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man and the birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Another effect of sinning against one's conscience is worshiping the creature of the creature more than the Creator. You say, preacher, we don't make statues of idols like uh, birds and animals and trees and bow down and worship those. That's what they did way back in the Stone Age. We don't do that today. No, but we worship man. That's what humanism is. The Enlightenment. 
In the Renaissance movement, man is the measure of all things, is the slogan. It's still around today. Been around since the Tower of Babel. Elevating man to the place where God belongs. Making man God. Folks, we're very much still doing that in America today. And it's an effect of sinning against our conscience. Look at verse 24. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Verse 24 says, An effect of sinning against our conscience is we slide down the slippery slope into sexual immorality. And he says they're actually dishonoring their own bodies. How can a point... How can a person get to the point from that sweet little lovable child to a, a grown-up that's off into sexual immorality as an adult? It's because they've sinned and sinned and sinned against their own conscience. Look at verse 25. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Idolatry. Idolatry. Verse 26. For this cause God gave them up into vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense, that is a reward, of their error, which was meat. Verse 26 says an effect of continuing to sin is that eventually it leads to the sin of homosexuality. Verse 27 says there are consequences. The recompense. Preacher, what are the consequences? Some might say this is simply talking about physical consequences, diseases and so forth, and that could be part of it. But, but mental and emotional consequences as well. Of sinning against their own conscience. Verse 28, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. What is a reprobate mind? Folks, a reprobate mind is one where the conscience just doesn't work anymore. It just doesn't work like it's supposed to work. It has been seared and it doesn't work as it's supposed to work. I read a book when I was in Bible college. In fact, I later taught out of it, entitled, How Should We Then Live? by a Presbyterian preacher named Francis Schaeffer. It was actually a philosophy book about some of the philosophies of man throughout history and how they compare with Scripture. But he prefaced it on Ezekiel 33.10 that where Ezekiel, for God, asked that question. If God is the God of this book, how should we then live? How should it affect who we are and how we live if there is a God? And He's the God of this book, who has revealed Himself to us in the way He's revealed Himself. 1 Peter 5.8 tells us, Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. You've ever seen any of those big cats do their hunting? They crouch down. They crawl around. Seeking their prey. Stalking their prey. Folks, that's what Satan does. To men and women, boys and girls, both saved and lost. As I close, would you turn back with me to Romans chapter 14, the chapter in which we began. In Romans chapter 14, the last two verses say this, Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. 
And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Now for those that are in our adult Sunday school class studying the book of Romans, we've not yet gotten to chapter 14, but it's coming up soon. But in this entire chapter, including the verses we read as our original text, Paul says that we all have to make decisions based upon serving our Master, who is God. Here, he's talking to saved people. Romans 14 is for saved people. And he says, I don't have to answer to some other man for how I obeyed my Lord, my Master. I don't answer to someone else. There are a lot of Christians that think that everybody's supposed to answer to them. I've known some preachers who thought that the church members were supposed to answer to the preacher. That's not the case. That's not the way it works. The preacher's supposed to give, give you what you need, and if you're not on the right track, he's supposed to try to shepherd you and get you back on the right track because he loves you and he loves God. But you're not going to have to give account to the preacher one day. You don't have to do it this day either. And I don't have to give account to you or him or her, and you don't. But we all have to give account to God one day. And he finishes chapter 14, what is chapter 14 divided in our Bibles, by saying, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. My youth pastor said when I was a teenager, he said, let me explain that. Let me put that in other words for you. He said, if you're in doubt, don't do it. If you're in doubt, don't do it. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. If you're not sure God is okay with you doing it, don't do it. That was good advice for a youth pastor to give a teenager. By the way, I found it's been good advice for me to follow even after I wasn't a teenager anymore. Can I tell you, even if you're not a teenager, it would still be good advice for you to follow too. It has served me well. If in doubt, don't do it. In chapter 14, he talks about different things that some of the Christians thought was okay and some didn't think were okay. He didn't say one group was right and the other one was wrong, by the way. You go back and read it for yourself later. He said some observe, observe certain holidays, some don't observe them. Those that observe them think that he said, as long as you're doing it because you think God wants you to do it and God is honored by you doing it, you keep observing those holidays. He said to this group over here, if you think you shouldn't be observing these holidays for whatever reason, if you don't think God wants you observing those holidays, don't observe those holidays. And you know what? He didn't condemn either group. Because what he's getting at is that every man must be fully persuaded in his own mind. You must do what God calls you to do. Now, if it's written clearly in Scripture, do this or don't do that, you don't get to choose. You just have to do it. You just have to follow it. But if it's one of those issues that's not clear cut, you're to take principles from this book apply them and say, Lord, based on the principles you've given me, this is what I think is right or wrong. And then you're supposed to follow that. God put the conscience within you that He put within you. And within me. Now if it's not in line with this book, it's because your conscience isn't working like it's supposed to. But I've got good news for you too. If your conscience is not working like it is supposed to work, dear friend, let me lay aside the harshness and let me just say this. Dear friend, God loves you. Paul, in writing to the church at Corinth, listed a whole bunch of sins. And we would say some of them were little sins and some of them were big sins. 
He said, and such were some of you. Dear friend, it doesn't matter what you have done before today. Both in your lost past and even after you got saved. From this day forward, you can be what God wants you to be. You say, preacher, if I'm to the point my conscience isn't working anymore, what's the use? Can I just tell you, once you and I start following this book, and once our desire again becomes the desire to please Him, that hard shell around that conscience will start to fall off. And the more you and I pray, read the Bible, spend time alone with God, talking with Him, wanting to please Him, folks, I promise you, that conscience can work again. He wants it to work again. And I, I, I've, I'll be honest with you, I've never heard a preacher preach on the exact subject I'm preaching on today. I've heard preachers talk about our conscience before. I've heard Bible teachers teach on it from a doctrinal standpoint, but I've never heard anybody preach the message I'm preaching today, but it's biblical. There are challenges that are facing Christians today that Christians have never faced. And there are going to be more. And if I tried to start naming them all, I, I wouldn't be able to. Because I haven't even conceived of the things that the bad guys have conceived of that's coming. I don't know what they all are. But I know Satan wants you and I to do anything but please God. And he's going to keep coming up with new things that displease God. And He's going to keep pressuring even believers to do things that violate that sacred conscience. In November of 1982, in Louisville, Nebraska, an independent Baptist pastor was put in jail and the church padlocked out front because they wouldn't follow the government's rules in only allowing state certified teachers to teach in their Christian school, to teach their children. Folks, we have people in our church that homeschool, we have some that use private schools, and we have some that use state schools. I think every parent is responsible to God to make that decision. But as a parent, you and I will be accountable to God for what choice we make. So then we have to be the ones to make that choice. Because we're the ones that God will hold accountable for that choice. So you have to have the right to not violate your sacred conscience in how you choose to educate your child. Pastors in Canada are already being arrested for preaching things contrary to public policy. In Canada. It's not too far removed from these United States. And I assure you, it's coming here. Pastors are, are or have been arrested in America for not closing their churches during the virus last year. Fortunately, here in Georgia, I don't know of any pastors that were arrested for that, even though we were told we had to close them. I know one independent Baptist church that didn't close their doors. And I also know one that ain't going to close them in the future. As long as this pastor is the pastor... And the government can say whatever they want to say and do whatever they want to do. And if they padlock the front door of the church, you all know where I live or I'll give you a map. We're not stopping having church in person unless you choose to not come in person. And if you choose to not come in person, there are going to still be at least two people there that I know of besides God. Parents have been raided by defects in one place after another for not doing this or that with their children that the government says they have to do. Folks, government does not have the authority to tell parents what to do with their own children. That includes health decisions, educational decisions, morality decisions, and all the other decisions regarding children. Children belong to God. And they are entrusted 
uniquely to parents. And parents solely are given the authority to do the things they need to do to make decisions for their children. We believe that. The Bible teaches that. Don't worry, I'm, I'm finishing. But I need to get this out. Because it's got to be said, and there may be somebody that needs to hear some of this. So what's coming in the future? Friends, I, I honestly don't know. Already on the horizon, well, already today, there are people being told they have to take certain vaccinations. Whether you want to or not, you've got to take it. Now you're being told you have to take it or lose your job. Eventually you're going to be told you have to take it or you can't go to the grocery store. It's coming. And there are other decisions. You have to register your firearms. Your right to protect and defend your life, liberty, and property. Or you have to put your children in this class or another required class because the government wants them to be taught a certain thing or a certain way to think. Or you're going to have to meter your own water well so the government can decide when you've used too much water and can shut it off like they can the power to your house. Or you're going to be told you have to carry an ID card with you to do the things that God gave you a right to do. To travel, to buy, to sell, to earn a living, to worship God. Eventually, of course, they're going to say, hey, cards are too easy to lose. We're just going to stick that thing right under the skin. We're going to chip you. Unfortunately, I know some Christians that I love dearly who have adopted the philosophy that because I'm a premillennialist, and I believe the rapture is going to happen before the millennium. And I'm a pre-tribulationalist. I believe the rapture is going to happen before the tribulation. I'm waiting for the rapture any day now. Because I'm a pre-tribber, I can just accept whatever the government tells me to accept because there's no chance it's the actual mark of the beast. That's during the tribulation. I'm going to be out of here when the tribulation comes. So whatever they tell me I have to do, I'm just going to do it just to save myself a lot of problems. Friends, I don't find that that is what the philosophy was of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when the king said, you've got to bow down or be thrown this very hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. I think Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego could have said, hey, we're already saved. We've already put our faith in God. We're going to heaven. We're going to be with God and the fathers. Uh, that have gone before us, uh, we can just go ahead and give in and do whatever we're told to do to save ourselves. We would have called them spiritual cowards. There wouldn't be a story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in this book if that's what they had done. Because I assure you, there were other Hebrew children that bowed down to the statue that day. And worship the golden image. But I love what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said. They said, our God is able to save us even from you, O King. Even out of your burning, fiery furnace. We believe that. But if not, even if He choose not, we still will not bow. Dear friends, you and I need to come to a point that the only thing that matters to me and you is pleasing Him and nothing else. Doesn't mean there aren't going to be some consequences. There were consequences that day for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There were consequences for those Baptist missionaries in Cameroon that were killed just a few years ago for staying and preaching when they were told to leave. And there are consequences to Christians everywhere around the world today for standing for what God has said to do or not do. 
I don't want to be the pastor of a congregation of people that will be able to say, God, our preacher didn't tell us we had an obligation to stand for what's right when things got hot. Because I'm going to give account of myself to God one day, and you're going to have to give account of yourself. You and I need to begin making some, some godly biblical convictions based on this book of what you will do and what you won't do. And as my youth pastor gave some wise advice when I was a teenager, don't wait till you're sitting in the back seat of the car to decide what you're going to do. Decide now what you will do and what you won't do. Because if you wait till the day that you're put on the spot to make the decision, your flesh is going to win and you're going to make the wrong decision. Decide before you're put in that situation what you will do and what you won't do. Our teenagers, most of them aren't here today, but I hope they listen to this message. Jesus said, fear not them that kill the body, but rather fear Him who is able to deliver both soul and body in hell. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray, dear God, Lord, that You take this message on sacred conscience. Lord, help us to genuinely understand our obligation to live for You to the best of our ability. Oh, dear God, I, I pray for our folks every day Lord, I know more and more increasingly our folks, as all Christians that love you, are under attack and being pressured to live ways and do things and think things they shouldn't think. Oh, dear God, help. Help my flock, I pray. Help me as pastor for us to be the examples of the believer in word and in deed. Dear God, use us until you come back for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand to your feet? Miss Mary, if you'll come and play. Brother Jim, if you'll come. and We're going to sing this morning. And folks, uh, if God has spoken to your heart, the altar is open. Maybe you just need to come say, God, I, I know my conscience isn't working quite like it is supposed to. Lord, today I want to put that back on the right path. If for any reason God has spoken to you at all, would you please feel the liberty to come kneel and get along with God?